Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of The Best of Pedal Shift. On this edition, we go all the way back to December 10th, 2015, for a very early episode, The Pedal Shift Project 037, Sturdy Touring Bikes and Opening Cans Without Tools. It's another one of those kind of classic early episodes where I just kind of threw a lot out there. Uh, I'm going to eliminate the journal version from this because actually there's a ton of news from all the way back in 2015 that's actually a little bit out of date so i don't want to confuse folks uh we will leave that out but we've got a hysterical gear talk with a uh a, literally his his name was crazy russian hacker that's the dude's handle uh talking about opening your cans without a can opener i love it it was great and then we uh talked about uh the, the nature of your bicycle and uh, having a sturdy touring bike and some ideas on how to handle touring from the perspective of somebody who's got a little extra weight on you. Um, so I think that this is a fantastic section to talk about. And then, of course, we have some old school connections, including the final disposition of my original folding bike, the Dehan, and uh, some old school five star reviews. So this was a fun episode and worthy of sharing and worthy of the best of moniker. Hope you enjoy. All right, now is the time for Gear Talk. And I have such a fun couple of things to talk about for Gear Talk. Uh, Gear Talk is when we talk about uh, things that sort of make our lives a little bit easier. Sometimes this can be hacks. Sometimes this can be uh, reviewing different types of gear. I've talked about lightening the loads. I've just run into some wacky stuff in the last couple of days. And one of those wacky things is from... The Crazy Russian Hacker, and please do yourself a favor, go to the show notes, go to pedalshift.net slash 037, and I've got the video embedded in here. Today we're going to do how to open a can, any kind of can, like this one. Or maybe just a regular one. Yeah, without no can opener or any kind of tools, no knives, no nothing, just hands. And a piece of concrete. <laughs> they check it out. The Crazy Russian Hacker shows you how you can open cans without tools. And it is totally fascinating. First of all, the concept of this Russian dude and his Russian friend, uh, just sort of having an entire YouTube series called Crazy Russian Hacker is fascinating to begin with. They are hysterical and awesome. But it also was a really helpful thing. I think that there have been a couple of times when I have had trouble with my can opener. Oh, I can even, I actually, I know the story. I have a really, really, really old, I want to call it a Swiss army knife, but I'll bet you it's not a Swiss army brand. It feels like it was a knockoff that I've had since, I swear, since I was a kid. Well, it finally got to the point where, and it'll be kind of hard to sort of describe this, but when uh, you're using the can opener part of it, that it actually bent all the way backwards. So you couldn't get the leverage that you needed to cut into the can. So I ran into this problem on one of my tours and I was unable to open up a can. I think it was of tuna or something like that that I was going to have with uh, one of my dinners. And uh, that was really frustrating. I wish I had known about the crazy Russian hacker because with just a little bit of pressure and rubbing a can on concrete, I don't want to, I mean, spoiler alert, this is how you do it. You can actually rub off the top of the I guess the weld, for lack of a better word, or the fold on the can, just enough so that you can start to squeeze the can to pop the top off. All you need is to be able to rub it on either, they say concrete, but I would think um, a decent, decent flat rock or something along those lines would work as well. Check out the video. It's hysterical because these guys are just bizarre and cool and awesome, but also it is a helpful little handy tool if you run into that problem when you are on the road. Um, it also got me thinking, why bother taking a can opener anymore? Because it does look pretty easy. So I'm gonna have to try it out sometime. Second on Gear Talk is from a new listener, David. Thank you for writing in. And David wrote in about weight limits for touring. And I'm going to read you what he's got. Um, he says, I was a Pacific Northwesterner from Seattle until I too relocated to DC. Now I've moved to Sonoma County, California. That is an upgrade, David. Good job. I'm replacing my 2011 Fuji touring bike stolen, and I appreciated your reviews of the long haul trucker and the Novara Safari. Uh, the Fuji was okay, but it was kind of kludgy, and there 
their newer ones are less committed to touring, so that's out. I rode to Cleveland via the CNO Canal Trail Gap and roads through Amish country when I was 270 pounds and had about 100 pounds of gear, front and rear panniers. That destroyed a wheel and my crank, which was probably a little loose. My issue right now is that I'm 260 pounds and the safari says it has a 250 pound weight limit. I'm 6'5", so I'm trying to evaluate that. Question, what constitutes overloading on a touring bike? What are the consequences and weak points of the bike that could be beefed up to handle heavier loads? And uh, th- this is an especially important question for us bigger riders. Thanks, David. Well, David, I think this was an awesome question. As I res- When I responded to you, I knew this was immediately going to be something that we were going to talk about on the show. So first off, are there bigger bike tours? Absolutely. There is no reason why you have to say no to bike touring if you are, you know, if you if you shop at the big and tall store. All right. So that's the first thing. Um, The short, quick answer is when it comes to the gear that you have, the bike that you have, if you are heavier and I have to say I'm probably I I run a little heavier than probably most. I'm not exactly, you know, one of those skinny racer types, Um, but I would say that the most important thing is a steel frame on your bike. Now, you don't have to, but when we're talking about carrying more of a load and whether it's you you as the load or your stuff as a load, you need to make sure that your bike can handle it. Steel it as a material is probably the best bet. It's tried and true. It's It's got the flex that's necessary to it and the strength that's necessary to it for a bike that's carrying a lot of weight. That's the one thing about bike touring bikes that are important is that they're built to handle weight a little bit better. So I'd start with the steel frame. Um, After that, the next thing that is a big fail point, one of the things that you found was the wheel. And I would say that for most touring bikes, they come stock with some pretty good wheels. Uh, I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination with this, but the materials within a good touring bike wheel can really make a big difference. Also with additional uh, uh, lacing of spokes, that can be helpful as well. The material that the spokes are made out of, there are a lot of people that spend a fair amount of money on their bikes first and foremost at the wheel level, and we'll get a custom wheel built. Now, for those of you who are... um, In a place like David uh, that has a lot of local bike shops that have a good wheel builder, this is where you can really buttress up your your ride a lot better. Um, For those of you who have sort of converted an old mountain bike or you're, you're working on sort of a conversion bike, a bike that wasn't built for touring, you may find that you're busting a bunch of spokes because you you're putting a lot of load on wheels that weren't built for it. Some of you may not be having to deal with it. Some of you may ride a lot lighter and this isn't much of an issue. But when you're dealing with a situation where you are hauling a lot of weight, this is another area that you really want to pay some attention to. So either consider investing in a touring bike that comes with a good stock wheel or make sure that you are replacing any stock wheels with a properly built good wheel and consult a local wheel builder on all of that if you don't know how to build that yourself. Um, Overloaded bikes, they blow out spokes. Um, The Goblin, the Green Goblin, was a bike that uh, I purchased and it lives in Portland, Oregon, and it sits there in the garage (laughs) just waiting for me to come back and ride it. But I've blown through a few spokes on that. It was built by Novara way, way back. I think uh, if I recall correctly, 1996. It's an older bike. And frankly, it the materials that were used on that bike were not as good as the current version of the Novara Safari. And that bike's uh, spokes, I blew through a bunch of them. I've gone through actually a couple of wheels for that bike. So um, I think that to the extent that I'm going to continue investing more money in that bike, I think I'm going to be putting a lot more uh, um, attention to a better wheel build. Um, I've gone through, let's see, uh, the, the wheel that I got, in the first place, then it busted enough spokes to actually replace that on a tour a few years ago. And then I think I mentioned this on a previous show. Uh, we still don't know what happened, but it spontaneously busted through a whole bunch of spokes on that wheel as well. So I'm actually on my third wheel for that bike. So the important thing to remember is that if you're not working with well-built wheels, 
the odds of those failing, that's probably going to be a real fail point. Think about it. That's where a lot of the pressure and the stress from weight, whether it's you or your gear, is going to be happening. So steel frame and a properly built wheel. Those are the things that I would start with. Two other things to consider. For Oh, any, t- whether, whether you're, you're, uh, whether, like I said, whether you shop in the big and tall store yourself or you're hauling a ton of gear and, and it feels like that, um, David, that you are probably best. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about your gear because I think your gear might be a little on the heavy side. A hundred pounds is a lot. And I think that it's entirely possible that you may be able to find some weight savings by leaving some things at home. It, even if you distribute it carefully like you did in front and rear panniers, you're going to still be putting a lot of stress on that bike. And obviously you did because you, you, if you went through some spokes, that's what was happening there. So I would say weight cuts should start mostly by considering what to leave at home. Um, maybe that's as simple as leaving your cooking gear. Leave that at home altogether. I mean, if you don't bring a stove and you don't bring cooking gear and you focus more on just eating on the road or uh, eating things that you don't have to cook when you are on the road and uh, aren't able to get to, I don't know, restaurants or gas stations or whatever, that might be something that can really help there. The other thing is to consider maybe going smaller on your sleeping kit. So maybe instead of a tent, go with a bivy or a hammock. There's tons to consider there. Everyone's got their own preferences. And, you know, I talked about, I think on the last show that, you know, when I tour in colder times, I like to bring the Green Dragon, that entirely way too heavy uh, stove. And so that's kind of a preference type of a thing. So figure that out, look at what you're bringing, and then maybe reconsider some of that to shave some of the pounds off of that 100 pounds of gear. I don't know if that included your bike as well, but if you're doing 100 pounds of gear and your bike and you, that's a lot of stuff. Um, So reconsider some of the things you're bringing. Another thing, and this, a lot of people probably were thinking this the moment I started talking about this, consider a trailer. The reason why I say that is if you can take some of the weight off of the bike, you know, that becomes less of a problem for the bike. So let's say that you do need to bring all of this gear that, you know, you're going for a really long time or you're going in areas where there's going to be really limited services, like going through the desert and you want to carry tons and tons of water or whatever. Oh, if you're removing the weight from your bike, you're going to be able to skirt the whole thing about the wheel builds and all that other kind of stuff. You might be able to do all sorts of different things. Now, trailers are a completely different beast. You're putting weight on trailers. Trailers have weight limits as well, so you got to be considering that. There are all sorts of different types of trailers from sort of the two-wheel burly style that you see the kids being towed around in. You can throw gear in that. I've seen that. Or um, the one-wheel style, like the Bob trailers. Those are really great, especially if you're going to be going on trails or any place where it's a double track or even a single track. Um, you're you're not going to be wanting to have two wheels on a single track area. So you want to think about things along those lines. I think they're pretty fantastic for utility. I've never toured with one. I've seen tons of people. I know there's listeners of the show that have toured with one. So I would say if, if, if riding with a trailer is something that you can consider as a touring situation, that may ultimately be the best bet for you. It sounds like you're in the market for a new bike anyways. I don't think you can go wrong with either the long haul trucker or the Navarro Safari. I think they're both excellent bikes. Um, it, it, it's just a question of sort of what's your what what's your preference? And there's so many different ways to do this that I would never say you've got to do it this way. In fact, I never say that about touring, except of course, you know, leave no trace. We all know about that. But um, when it comes to the bike versus trailer versus how you want to do it, a lot of personal preference, but those hopefully will be some options for you to think about as you're trying to redistribute weight, lighten your load and uh, get out there. Because I think that that's the most important thing to be able to do is just to freaking get out there. So anyways, thanks so much for writing in, David. That's uh, a really, really great question. I know it's something that a lot of people deal with, and uh, I'm glad that we were able to include that on the show. And uh, feel free to write in and let me know how it all goes and what you end up picking. And if you have some ideas on how to lighten your load or how to deal with carrying heavy loads, Again, whether it's you or your gear, we'd love to hear about it. You can uh, get reach out to the show just like David did, and that's pedalshiftproject at gmail.com. It is the connections time, and we've got a bunch of connections since the last show. Uh, let's start off with the legend friend of the show, Johnny K. 
I, I, Johnny K had, I think, about 17 separate things to say from the last show. So uh, actually for the last two shows, he was he was behind. So Johnny K brings tons of new information on leather care knowledge. If you're with us for the last show, I was talking about uh, uh, caring for a leather saddle or a Brooks saddle in particular, like I have. He has a two part and I swear to God, two part. Uh, awesome, awesome background. Um, lots of lots of uh, background from his experience with saddle care for horses and for other things as well. And it was just chock full of good information. Go check that out in the show notes. I've got the links in there as well. Johnny K also brings uh, some uh, really bizarre and interesting and cool winter touring kick sled. Um, Go check that out. That is, that is a really interesting image um, for maybe I suppose cross training or something like that. Johnny K, thank you so much for sharing all of that. You're a legend, sir, and a national treasure, as always. I also wanted to share that we had the first pedal ship meetup in New Jersey. What? I didn't say anything about it? Well, it was just it was just me meeting up with the legendary peanut butter jar, Matt, who bought one of my bikes. You may recall that I had, uh, until very recently, owned two folding bikes. I owned my first folding bike, which was a Dehan, which was the bike that took me on that really wacky transit-aided adventure from D.C. to Boston. Well, once I bought the Brompton, I was looking to sell it, and uh, Matt actually was interested in it. And uh, I have a picture in the show notes of Matt with that bike, and I'm hoping, uh, Matt, that that is doing well for you. That bike is a really, really, really good one, and I'm uh, excited that I was able to find a new good home for it. I was really great. So I drove up to Jersey and was able to uh, uh, meet Matt's wife as well, which was a lot of fun as well. And uh, got to go to Wegmans, which is my favorite grocery store in the world. It's from where I grew up. It's a thing. Last but not least, we can has more five stars. Yes. Friend of the show, Scott McAllister Morgan. Thank you for adding in your five star review. Scott writes, if you were the kind of person who'd rather take a solo tour than draft amongst the Peloton and you can't help but nerd out over all things bike or you're just as excited as listening to someone else do so, then this is the podcast for you. Listen to Tim Mooney talk about routes, gear, traveling with your bike, the people you meet on tour, and most importantly, fitting bike tours into your life. Thank you, Scott. And we also have another five star review from, and this is an awesome name, Gonna Stay Fat. Gonna Stay Fat writes, relatable, five stars. While creating art or while I am writing, Tim has me feeling like a part of the conversation. He shines a light on all the wonderful aspects of touring by bicycle and has me very enthusiastic for my own tour plans. Gonna stay fat. First of all, I mean, we, we got gonna stay fats. I, I'm, I'm just going to scroll through here. You know, gonna stay fats, probably your best name there. An opinionated girl, situated, situational ma- mathematics, moon dogs with a Z. There's a lot of good names in here, and they're all five stars, and I want to thank you all for doing that. The reason why five-star reviews are sort of helpful is, uh, I think I've explained this before, iTunes has some you know dark magic or something like that, that apparently the more of these types of reviews that are out there, the more likelihood that's going to pop up in search results, which means that you're helping me out, and you're helping the show out, and you're growing the community if you give a five-star review. So if you have the time and you have the inclination, feel free to give a five-star review. Give a four-star review. Hell, give a one-star review if you hate the show. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net. Lots of great content. You can hear the Pedal Shift project through iTunes or your favorite podcast aggregator. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his debut album. The track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Habitat, wherever cool music is available. <laughs>